They told me to empty my mind. They told me to focus on a point. I didn't even know what that means. They told me to focus on my breathing. Nothing worked. I quit and concluded everything related to spirituality is BS. But due to some hard experiences, I was forced to take another look. But this time it clicked. I wonder why people don't understand the true meanings behind meditation. I guess because people got confused between the consequences of mediation and the actual practice of meditation. Emptying your mind, focus on a point, etc. are all consequences of mediation and not meditation. You automatically do those things while meditating. Meditation starts with the answer to a simple question. In case you haven't noticed, you have a mental dialogue going on inside your head that never stops. It just keeps going and going. Have you ever wondered why it talks in there? How does it decide what to say and when to say it? How much of what it says turns out to be true? How much of what it says is even important? And if right now you are hearing, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any voice inside my head. That's the voice we're talking about. In your head, you have a roommate. If you would like to meet your roommate, just try to sit inside yourself for a while in complete solitude and silence. You have the right, it's your inner domain. But instead of finding silence, you're going to listen to incessant chatter. Why am I doing this? I have more important things to do. This is a waste of time. There's nobody in here but me. What's this all about? Right on cue, there's your roommate. You may have a clear intention to be quiet inside, but your roommate won't cooperate. And it's not just when you try to be quiet. It has something to say about everything you look at. I like it. I don't like it. This is good. That's bad. It just talks and talks. You don't generally notice because you don't step back from it. You're so close that you don't realize that you're actually hypnotized into listening to it. Basically, you're not alone in there. There are two distinct aspects of your inner being. The first is you, the awareness, the witness, the center of your willful intentions, and the other is that which you watch. The problem is the part that you watch never shuts up. If you could get rid of that part, even for a moment, the peace and serenity would be the nicest vacation you've ever had. You have to watch this if you want to be free of it. You don't have to do anything about it, but you have to get wise to the predicament you're in. You have to realize that somehow you've ended up with a mess for an inner roommate. If you want it to be peaceful in there, you're going to have to fix the situation. The way to catch on to what your inner roommate is really like is to personify it externally. Make believe that your roommate, the psyche, has a body of its own. You do this by taking the entire personality that you hear talking to you inside and imagine it as a person talking to you on the outside. Just imagine that another person is now saying everything that your inner voice would say. Now spend a day with that person. You've just sat down to watch your favorite TV show. The problem is, you have this person with you. Now you'll get to hear the same incessant monologue that used to be inside, except that it's sitting next to you on the couch talking to itself. Did you turn off the light downstairs? You better go check. Not now, I'll do it later. I want to finish watching the show. No, do it now. That's why the electric bill is so high. You sit in silent awe, watching all of this. Then, a few seconds later, your couchmate is engaged in another dispute. Hey, I want to get something to eat. I'm craving some pizza. No, you can't have pizza now, it's too far to drive. But I'm hungry. When will I get to eat? To your amazement, these neurotic bursts of conflicting dialogue just keep going on and on. And as if that's not enough, instead of simply watching TV, this person starts verbally reacting to whatever comes on the screen. At one point, after a redhead appears on the show, your couchmate starts mumbling about an ex-spouse and a painful divorce. Then the yelling starts, just as though the ex-spouse were in the room with you. Then it stops, just as suddenly as it started. At this point, you find yourself hugging the far corner of the couch in a desperate attempt to get as far away from this disturbed person as you possibly can. Will you dare to do this experiment? Don't try to make the person stop talking. Just try to get to know what you live with inside by externalizing the voice. Give it a body and put it out there in the world just like everybody else. Let it be a person who says on the outside exactly what the voice of your mind says inside. Now make that person your best friend. After all, how many friends do you spend all of your time with and pay absolute attention to every word they say? 
How would you feel if someone outside really started talking to you the way your inner voice does? How would you relate to a person who opened their mouth to say everything your mental voice says? After a very short period of time, you would tell them to leave and never come back. But when your inner friend continuously speaks up, you don't ever tell it to leave. No matter how much trouble it causes, you listen. There's almost nothing that voice can say that you don't pay full attention to. It pulls you right out of whatever you're doing, no matter how enjoyable, and suddenly you're paying attention to whatever it has to say. Imagine that you're in a serious relationship and are about to get married. You're driving to the wedding and it says, Maybe this is not the right person. I'm really getting nervous about this. What should I do? If someone outside of you said that, you'd ignore them. But you feel you owe the voice an answer. You have to convince your nervous mind that this is the right person, or it won't let you walk down the aisle. That's how much respect you have for this neurotic thing inside of you. You know that if you don't listen to it, it will bother you every day of your life. I told you not to get married. I said I wasn't sure. The bottom line is undeniable. If somehow that voice managed to manifest in a body outside of you, and you had to take it with you everywhere you went, you wouldn't last a day. If somebody were to ask you what your new friend is like, you'd say, this is one seriously disturbed person. Just look up neurosis in the dictionary and you'll get the picture. That being the case, once you've spent a day with your friend, what is the probability you'd go to them for advice? After seeing how often this person changed their mind, how conflicted they were on so many subjects, and how emotionally overreactive they tended to be, would you ever ask them for relationship or financial advice? As amazing as it seems, you do just that every moment of your life. Having taken its rightful place back inside of you, it is still the same person who tells you what to do about every aspect of your life. Have you ever bothered to check its credentials? How many times has that voice been totally wrong? She doesn't care for you anymore. That's why she hasn't called. She's going to break up with you tonight. I can feel it coming, I just know it. You shouldn't even answer the phone if she calls. After 30 minutes of this, the phone rings and it's your girlfriend. She's late because it's your one-year anniversary and she was preparing for a surprise dinner. It was definitely a surprise to you since you completely forgot the anniversary. She says she's on her way over to pick you up. Well, you're very excited and your inner voice is chatting about how great she is. But haven't you forgotten something? Haven't you forgotten about the bad advice the inner voice gave you that caused you to suffer for the last half hour? What if you had hired a relationship advisor who had given you that terrible advice? They had completely misread the entire situation. Had you listened to the advisor, you never would have picked up the phone. Wouldn't you fire them on the spot? How could you ever trust their advice again after seeing how wrong they were? Well, are you going to fire your inner roommate? After all, its advice and analysis of the situation were totally wrong. No, you never hold it responsible for the trouble it causes. In fact, the next time it gives advice, you're all ears. Is that rational? How many times has that voice been wrong about what was going on or what will be going on? Maybe it's worth noticing whom you're going to for advice. When you've sincerely tried these practices of self-observation and awareness, you'll see that you're in trouble. You'll realize that you've only had one problem your entire life, and you're looking at it. It's pretty much the cause of every problem you've ever had. Now the question becomes, how do you get rid of this inner troublemaker? The first thing you'll realize is that there's no hope of getting rid of it until you really want to. Until you've watched your roommate long enough to truly understand the predicament you're in, you really have no basis for practices that help you deal with the mind. Once you've made the decision to free yourself from the mental melodrama, you are ready for teachings and techniques. You will now have a real use for them. You will be relieved to know that you are not the first person to have this problem. There are those who have gone before you who found themselves in the same situation. Many of them looked for guidance from those who had mastered this field of knowledge. They were given teachings and techniques, such as yoga, which were created to help in this process. Yoga is not really about getting your body healthy, although it does that too. Yoga is about the knowledge that will help you out of your predicament, the knowledge that can free you. Once you've made this freedom the meaning of your life, there are spiritual practices that can help you. These practices are what you do with your time in order to free yourself from yourself. You will eventually catch on that you have to distance yourself from your psyche. You do this by setting the direction of your life when you're clear and not letting the wavering mind deter you. Your will is stronger than the habit of listening to that voice. There is nothing you can't do. 
Your will is supreme over all of this. If you want to free yourself, you must first become conscious enough to understand your predicament. Then you must commit yourself to the inner work of freedom. You do this as though your life depended on it because it does. As it is right now, your life is not your own, it belongs to your inner roommate, the psyche. You have to take it back. Stand firm in the seat of the witness and release the hold that the habitual mind has on you. This is your life, reclaim it. Doing the observation of your roommate is where the true meditation starts from.